Beloved, I want to say at the outset tonight that some will hear things they never knew. But rejoice that truth came. We're going to talk about ghosts, spooks, hands, zombies, poltergeists and whatever else they are known as. And we're going to talk about dead people. Where are they? And what are they doing? There was a time in our history before they perfected the science of embalming in this country. And especially when people lived in isolated areas and could not get to hospitals and morgues, that if a loved one passed, they would often bury that loved one the same day. And many mistakes were made. A man by the name of Mark Walston wrote an article in a Maryland newspaper and he talked about a person who had a most peculiar kind of invention. This man invented a coffin with a spring lock top strong enough to throw open a grave that was not covered too deeply. There was a reason for that. People had been put in those boxes who weren't yet dead. A Gallup poll revealed that over 8 million people now claim to have had a near death experience. There is a book, this is an article read right out of the paper. There is a book called Embraced by the Light. It has been a bestseller for a long time about people who claim to die and are embraced by light and they see other loved ones dead and eventually come back to life down here. Another man by the name of Harry Shepard of Orange County, California, belonged to the Orange County Society for Psychic Research. And he bought a tape recorder and went out into the graveyard at night listening for voices from beyond the grave. And it says in this article, listening to the dead, from spirit voices to poltergeists, they've got it on tape. Now they've played these tapes, and they hear groans and mutterings and other such noises, which they believe prove the existence of a higher life after death. Today we've come to the place where spiritualism ranks right along with sex and violence in the making of movies and television stories for the interest of the people is captivated. Sex, violence, spiritualism. Not long ago, I read of a movie called Ghost, and Whoopi Goldberg got an Oscar for playing the part of a medium. And they make the stories beautiful, you see. A girl lost her lover, and, and, and this medium brought them together. 
And when that thing was shown on an airplane, a friend of mine said folk were just weeping. And when it was over, a lady said, I believe that's the way it is. Ladies and gentlemen, that is not the way it is. Every now and then, these things show up in my mailbox. A Capitol Hill astrologist. Do you ever wonder what the future holds for you? Would you like to know who and when you should marry? Maybe that's why the divorce rate is so high. Would you like to know who your enemies are? How to be a success? How to win the one you love? This gifted woman can answer any and all questions. All you need is her. You don't have to pray if this is true. And you know, it's out here in Phoenix. I was driving home the other day and there's a house sitting off there, palmist. They're here. This came in my mailbox in, a, in an envelope and I opened it and it said, your corpse is required to attend the freak worship mass for the unholy living dead. There's a poem in here. It says, Good night, sweet black prince of death. Legions of hell lull thee to thy rest. When witches Sabbath at full moon high, thy soul, thy mind will smoke and die. I don't know why they said this to me. But there is no end to it. Whether you want to believe it or not today, a large number of congressmen and senators depend on astrologers, astrologers before making decisions that can affect the life of everyone in America. A former president not far removed and his wife got information on hard and basic decisions from an astrologer before he could make up his mind. Many of these people have 900 numbers. The minute you start to talk, they are making money. They've got a movie star and a song, a songstress advertising on national television. All of these people Draining funds, deceiving minds, confounding the public, confusing them, and transplanting faith, which is displaced by all of this foolishness. 1989 was a bad year for psychics and astrologers. A man by the name of Ralph Blodgett went out and purchased the National Enquirer, Star, Globe, National Examiner, Sun, News Extra, and every other tabloid that featured these people with their predictions. He then put into his computer every one he found in those magazines. There were 550. They were made by folk like Gene Dixon, Barbara Duchess, Emo Dumas, Penelope Fortune, Montana Kelly, Sven Peterson, Bill Starr, and 28 others rich already on the gullibility of the public. This man isolated 550 predictions, 535 failed. They were wrong 97% of the time. And yet people get on that 900 number and they pay their money. They will believe everything except that which has never been proved a lie. 1989, Gene Dixon said, that Dukakis would hold high office. Dan Quayle would resign as vice president. Salman Rushdie would flee to America and terrorists would hijack a plane 
from Kennedy Airport and crash it into the White House. These are bold predictions. Not a single one of them came true. Now, beloved, there is something that links all of this together. The first recorded lie in the Bible. God had said to Adam and Eve, of all the trees you may freely eat, except the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And God said, the day you eat thereof, thou shalt surely die. Later on in chapter 3, when Satan accosted Eve through the medium, get that word, the medium of a serpent. He spoke to Eve and said, hasn't God said you shouldn't eat? Of the trees of the garden. He always tries to fix God's word in a way to make you misunderstand it. And Eve was quick to come to God's defense. Oh no, she said. God said we may eat of all these trees except one. And that is the tree in the midst of the garden. The tree of knowledge of good and evil. For God has said the day we eat of that we shall surely die. Aha, said the devil. That's the one. God knows that you are missing out on something. That's what he tells folk who haven't tried drugs yet. Why, you haven't lived till you try. Your mind will expand. That's true. You'll get a thrill you never had before. He makes it so enticing. The devil wants you to think God is keeping something from you that you really ought to have in order to be happy. So he said to Eve, that is the very one, for God knows the day you eat of it, you'll become like God. Now Satan had gotten kicked out of heaven because he was going to be like God. Now he's telling Eve, if you disobey, you will be like God. But she said, God said, if we eat it, we will surely die. And the devil then gave the first lie recorded in the history of the world. He said, ye shall not surely die. And you're talking about double talk. That's it. He seems to be saying you're going to die, but not surely. You, you, yeah, you're going to die, but you won't surely be dead. And most of the world today has bought into that lie. They think folk die, but not surely. No need you laughing. I don't imagine there are a handful of people here tonight who would go alone into a cemetery at midnight. Why? You know those folk are dead, but not surely. <laughs> well, I want to tell you something tonight. The safest place in Phoenix is the cemetery at midnight. You don't have to worry about the dead folk as these living ones that'll cut your throat. <laughs> Strong theologians, wittingly and unwillingly, support this falsehood by the devil. One of the most powerful hymns I've ever sung had a line in there that said, a charge to keep I have, a God to glorify, a never dying soul to save and carry to the sky. Ladies and gentlemen, please, even if it shocks you, understand what I'm about to say. You read it from Genesis to Revelation. The Bible never once mentions a never dying soul. Not once. It is all a part of Satan's falsehood, supported by theology, supported by hymns, Supported by tradition. And he's got the whole world it seems. Under his sway. On the screen tonight. I'm going to show you a text that I want to refer to now. 1 Timothy 6 and verse 15. There the Bible tells us that God only. What's that last word I used? You know what only means don't you? Solamente. God only. Only hath immortality. 
That means nobody else has it. Only God has it. In Romans chapter 2, verses 6 and 7, the Bible says, men seek immortality. Now, if you already had it, you wouldn't seek it. I got my keys in my pocket, so I'm not seeking my keys. God only. Let it sink in. It's the Word of God. Write it down. Read it at home. God only hath immortality, and men seek immortality. They don't have it. Now, the Bible says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 13, But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. The majority of people in Christendom today lose a loved one and believe they are in heaven. The Bible does not say that. Please don't think I'm insensitive. Please don't think I'm hard-hearted. Yesterday, they buried my favorite, one of my favorite aunts. Today, they buried my brother-in-law. My darling mother died in 1959. My father in 1968. I know the pain of death. And if you stay with the word of God tonight, you're going to discover that God's way is the happiest way. God's way is the best way. You see, when a person loses a loved one, that person is especially vulnerable. Because you would give almost anything. Bring the lights down, please, so we can see this. You'd give almost anything not to break that connection. To hear a voice again. To see a loved one again. Loneliness drives some to distraction. And the devil wants to take advantage of that. I am still waiting for the lights to go down, please. Somebody do that for us. Thank you. Thank you. More, more, more. Thank you. Now, all of us have been affected by this enemy called death. If you haven't, you will. I remember for years, nobody in my immediate family went to sleep. And then all of a sudden it began. And it seemed that too regularly somebody close to me was going to sleep. My heart would break. There were those sleepless nights, those sighs, those tears. But God's word is encouraging. God's word is best. Now the Bible says, which in times he shall show who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and Lord of lords. Who is that? Yes, sir. Who only hath what? Now, that's either the truth or it's not the truth. I choose to believe the Bible. Don't you? And the Bible says only Christ or God has immortality. Ladies and gentlemen, the angels don't even have it. The Bible says that Satan, who was an angel, and those who fell with him are going to be destroyed in the flames of hell, root and branch. Matthew 25, 41 says, hell is prepared for the devil and his angels. They're going to die. God only hath immortality. Man does not have immortality. Man is mortal. Now you've always heard that. The Bible speaks of mortal man. Mortal means can die. Immortal means can't die. Only God hath immortality. Man is mortal. Man can die. 
Now, ladies and gentlemen, in the Garden of Eden, Satan used a medium. Speaking through the serpent, he said to Eve, Ye shall not surely die. You're going to die, but not surely. Well, let's see how man was made. The Bible says, The Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man what? It doesn't say man was given a soul or man had a soul. Man was a soul. He became a soul. If you want to know what a soul looks like, look up here at me. Or look at the person sitting next to you. When Paul was on that ship in a storm, the Bible says there were in all X number of souls. These were living people on board that ship. A soul is a man or a woman, a generic man, of course. Now the Bible says God made him out of dust and gave him the breath of life. And when the union came about, man became a living soul. Now the Bible says in Ecclesiastes 12, 7, that when man dies, then shall the dust return to the earth as it was, and the spirit shall return to God who what? When he made man, he formed him of the dust and then gave him the breath of life. When man dies, the process is reversed. His body returns to the dust, and his spirit returns to God who gave it. This word spirit, what does it mean? Where does it come from? In the Hebrew, it's from Ruach. In the Greek, it's pneuma. Say that last word with me, pneuma. Now, now let me show you uh, how simple it is. When a man catches a dreadful respiratory disease, it is often called pneumonia. It was originally believed to be caused by bad air. Pneuma means air or breath or wind. So does the Old Testament Hebrew word rock. Ladies and gentlemen, God gave to man the breath of life and when man dies, his body returns to the dust and his spirit, which comes from the Greek word pneuma, returns to God who gave it. Job 27, 3. There the Bible says, all the while, my breath is in me and the spirit of God is in my what? That's why you breathe. Now that's clear, isn't it? That's where the word spirit comes from. It doesn't mean there's a little man that sits on your shoulder and when you die he lights out to heaven while you go to the grave. This was made up. Before I finish out here, I'm going to tell you who made it up and why. It's clear. And if you don't want to wait, you can go to the library and read it. There are no secrets. People just don't study and don't pray and don't read God's word. It's clear. The Spirit returns to God who gave it. The Bible says in Psalm 104 and verse 29, Thou hidest thy face, they are troubled. Thou takest away what? That's all. Thou takest away their breath. They die and return to their dust. And so out in the graveyard, you see all of these stones. People are buried out there. Many of them have already dissolved and returned to the dust. And the only thing that left them was the air, the wind, the breath, interpreted spirit. They die and return to their dust. Psalm 146 and verse 4 says, His breath goeth forth, he returneth to his earth in that very day his thoughts perish. They do what? Perish. That very day. That same writer goes on to say that 
his thoughts not only perish, but his love and his hatred. I remember one day a man died and a fella called me. Oh, Pastor, I got to see you. I got to see you. I said, well, come on. And what is it about? He came in. He was scared to death. He said, this man died and I mistreated him and I'm scared he's coming back. I said, man, if he didn't get you before he died, you don't have to worry now. He's gone. He's not even thinking about you. His thoughts perish. Would you say amen out there? The Bible goes on to say something else. The Bible says Ecclesiastes 9, 5, For the living know that they shall what? But the dead know not what? Do you believe God's word? If you do, say amen. amen. Even if I'd never heard it before, if I saw that, read it in my Bible, I'd believe God. Dead folk know nothing. And for some reason, Satan has given people the impression that when a man is dead, he knows more than he ever knew before. Some of them died in nothing but sinners, and yet he wants to bring them back and let them tell you how to live. They didn't even live. The Bible says that when they die, the dead know not anything. And I believe what the Bible teaches. The Psalm 115 and verse 17 says, The dead praise not the Lord, neither any that go down into silence. Ladies and gentlemen, my uncle died. He was a great preacher in the Methodist church. And I didn't know him because we'd never lived near him. And when he died, we went to the funeral. And we were sitting there, and it is a very delicate time for family. And a lot of ministers naturally were there. And they began to talk about this good preacher who had died. And I'm a boy and I'm sitting there listening. And he was lying right there and the coffin was open. And finally, the man who really was assigned to give the eulogy apparently found himself desperate because everything had been said by all these other preachers. So I imagine he decided to be very emotional. And I can see him in my mind's eye right now. He stood and he was preaching and he leaned back and he put his hand up and he looked up into the ceiling. He said, I can see Rev Reeves now up in glory, praising God and leaping around the throne. And Rev Reeves was lying right there in the coffin and all of us had our eyes on him. He hadn't gone anywhere. We looking at him. Ladies and gentlemen, if you plan to praise God, you better get it done before you die. Would you say amen out there? Amen. Along, listen, along with some of these things I told you, I'm going to make clear to you before I finish out here. This came from the same treasure. This idea that you die and you go off into some never, never land. Where if you raise enough money, we can get you out and into glory. It's called purgatory. There is no such place. If you're going to serve God, you better do it while the blood is running warm in your veins. You better do it while you're clothed in your right mind. You better do it while your heart is still pumping. Now is the accepted time, Jesus said. Today, if you hear his voice, harden not your heart. Don't put it off and take a chance on some never, never land. It will never, never happen. Now, it's sad, but listen to what the Bible says. And now, I want you to read it all with me, and you'll get the reference in a moment. So man lieth down, and what? Wait, 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 wait. What about these ghosts? What about these things witches bring up? And, and mediums and uh, or necromancers and, and, and channelers. What about it when they bring you to their house and you put your money on the table and then they cut out the lights? Why do they always have to cut out the light? Because the devil is the prince of darkness. And he's got to work his trick on you. And all of a sudden you got your hands on the table. And, and she says, I'm beginning to see. And you look and you see. What is it? Well, I'll tell you what it ain't, if you'll pardon my language. The Bible says, man, life down, and what? 
Wait, wait, wait. Now it tells you when he's going to rise. Till the what? Till the heavens be no more, they shall not awake nor be raised out of their sleep. Ladies and gentlemen, do you believe God's word? Let's read on. Job said, oh, that thou wouldest hide me in where? That thou wouldest keep me secret until thy wrath be passed. That thou wouldest support me a set time and remember me. Job 14, 12, and 13. Job said, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to die. Lord, just have me hidden in the grave. But don't forget me. Make sure that when your wrath is passed, you'll remember me. Job was so sure of it that he testified before his friends, I know that my Redeemer liveth. And that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. And though after my skin worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh shall I see God. But he said, Lord, hide me in the grave till your wrath be passed. What wrath? These last days are going to see the unmingled wrath of God. There's going to be a time of trouble, prophecy says, such as never was since there was a nation. And Jesus is going to come. And the trumpet is going to sound. And mountains will move out of their places. Islands of the sea will be swallowed up. There will be an earthquake such as never was since there was a nation. The wrath of God will fall upon the impenitent. And the wicked will be screaming in terror. Hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne. And from the wrath of the Lamb. Job said, just appoint me a place. And remember me. Well I want to tell you when a saint dies. That saint goes to the grave. That saint's body will return to the dust. But let me tell you that's not all. We are told that when the funeral is conducted. An angel marks the spot. And when Jesus returns. Those angels will be told. Gather mine elect from the four corners of the earth. He will say to the north give up. And to the south keep not back. Bring my sons from afar, my daughters from the ends of the earth, and myriads of angels will flutter out over the face of the earth and roll back the dusty blankets, and saints will come out of those graves like popcorn popping on a stove. They're going to rise. Never to die again. The Bible says... In chapter 15 of Job, his sons come to honor, and he knoweth it not. They are brought low, but he perceiveth it not of them. When I pastored a large church in Ohio, there was a saint belonged to my church who was so stricken with illness she couldn't come out. So I would go on Sabbaths to her, and I would take deacons and deaconesses. We'd carry along fruit and flowers, and we would sing and have service, just like we were in church. And she rejoiced in Christ Jesus. And I kept going, and one day I noticed that all of the flowers came from us. All of the cards came from us. All of the fruit came from us. So I said, my dear sister, don't you have children? She said, oh, pastor, they don't care about me. Oh, I never heard such sad words. They don't care about me. I never hear from them. They don't help. And then one day, alas, our dear sister died. And the family came. And when I was preaching that funeral, one of those daughters had to be carried out bodily. I thought to myself, you're not impressing me. And when we went out to get ready to drive to the cemetery, I had a brand new Buick. And I started to open my door, and the funeral director ran to me and said, Pastor, you can't drive that. I said, well, all right, what do you want me to do? He said, I want you to get in that car. And he put me in a gold-colored Cadillac. And as we turned the curve, I counted... 14 golden Cadillacs in a row. Now that cost some money. 
But these children who wouldn't send a card, these children who wouldn't phone their mother, these children had come in, the very ones who couldn't give her a bowl of fruit, wanted to make a show before the public and hired all gold Cadillacs. I tell you the truth, I got so disgusted, I didn't know what to do. And I want to say to anybody today who has a mother or a father or both living, if you ever expect to do anything for them, do it now. You got some flowers, give it to them now while they can smell it. You're not impressing anybody after they're dead. Some of these dear old parents are so lonely, they don't know what to do. Some of them sit in nursing homes and just vegetate and don't get a single visitor. Shame! Shame before God. The Bible says his sons come to honor. They write resolutions and they make speeches and they do a lot of talk. I mean, even the good sons, but the dead doesn't know anything about it. If you're going to say it, say it while they live. When they're dead, they are gone. They don't know it. Now, what about those who say all the saints are in heaven? Those same people love the day of Pentecost when the Holy Ghost came down. Well, this is Peter's sermon on the day of Pentecost. And Peter said in Acts chapter 2 and verse 34, David, who? is not ascended into heaven. Now, beloved, beloved, God said David was a man after his own heart. If it's true that all the saints are in heaven, David ought to be up there. Wouldn't you say amen to that? But on the day of Pentecost, somebody said, well, when Jesus rose from the dead, that's when they came out. This is 50 days later. And Peter said, David is not in heaven. I believe what the Bible says. Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his sepulcher, which means his grave, is with us unto this day. Acts 2, 29. I have journeyed more than once to what they call the Holy Land. I've gone in to see the tomb of David. It is revered over there. David's burial place is still here. And David is still in there. Now I told you don't be offended if you learn tonight that your wonderful mother is not in heaven. I got better news than that. Let's go on and see what the Bible says. Can a soul die? What about this hymn that you sing a never dying soul to say? In the book of Ezekiel chapter 18 and verse 4, the Bible says, The soul that sinneth, it shall what? Die. Now that's the word of God. I'll tell you where this other came from later. But for tonight, let's concentrate on truth, not error. The Bible says, the soul that sinneth, it shall die. And the Bible says, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Every loving one of us is going to die unless Jesus comes soon. Going to die. My mother was a saint all my life. When she died, I sat in the living room and my dad came in and sat beside me. And I said, Pop, as I have known her all these years, I cannot think of a single bad thing about my mother. And I was sincere. I couldn't think of her ever using a bad word. I couldn't think of her ever getting even with anybody. And when, now you know some people are not much good. Now you know that. But my mother absolutely would not say that. We had a neighbor that was hardly worth pushing over. And one day I heard some people talking about him. And my mother said, oh, leave him alone. He's harmless. And I thought, listen to that. He's harmless. She had to say something good. And yet in spite of her devotion, her love for Jesus, that mother who could get prayers through. When people got sick, they sent for her. That mother whose faith could move the arm of God. 
That mother went to sleep with a smile on her face, took my brother's hand and joined it with my daddy and pointed up when she could no longer talk. And my brother said, Mom, are you telling me to meet you in heaven? And she nodded her head, smiled herself to sleep. Five years later, I baptized him. He told me, Chuck, it wasn't your preaching. I couldn't forget mother pointing upward, asking me to meet her in the kingdom of God. Would somebody say amen out there? Amen. This thing is real. And when you come down to die, you got to have a real hope. You don't want a hope based on fairy tales and human tradition. You don't want a hope based on things that men have made up. Your hope has got to be on a solid rock. And that rock is the word of God. Bible says the soul that sinneth it shall what? And that's what the Bible means ladies and gentlemen. And now all of this stuff that we refer to as spiritualism has come out of that lie that Satan told. It's all based on communication with the dead. Satan said you're not going to die. God said you're going to die. I want to ask you tonight which do you believe? Oh I hope so. Satan is the one who said, you will not surely die. He used the serpent as a medium, spoke through it, and told a lie that has affected the whole world. And now look, that old serpent said to Eve, if you disobey God, you're going to really live. Remind me of a rich man whose son owned a sports car. And he loved that car so much, when he died, his father decided to give him a party. He brought out a bulldozer, and he dug a great big hole. And he put his son's body in his sports car. And then he got a bunch of pretty girls and had them come and stand around the tomb throwing flowers as the car was let down in the tomb. And some unthinking person saw all of this uh, this, all of this opulence and all of this show and he turned to somebody else and said man that cat's living he wasn't living he was dead I don't care how many cars they buried him in he not going to drive it anywhere he not going to double clutch anymore he dead that serpent lied and the serpent said unto the woman, ye shall not surely die. That's Genesis 3, 4. Now I want you to read about this Satan. The Bible says in John 8, 44, when he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own. For he is a liar and the father of it. The first lie came from him. And he's the father of lies. And yet Christians, church folk, believe his lie. Some of them don't realize it, but they do. They do not read what you have read tonight. And brother and sister, I could stand here another hour and give you text after text after text after text that show that Satan is a liar and the father of it. But let us go on. The Bible, this is a long one. Read it with me. I don't mean read it out loud, but follow me. There shall not be found among you Anyone that maketh his son or his daughter to pass through the fire, or that useth divination, or an observer of times, or an enchanter, or a witch, or a charmer, or a consulter with familiar spirits, or a wizard, or a necromancer, that's somebody who talks to the dead. Let's read on. For all that do these things are an abomination unto the Lord. And because of these abominations, the Lord thy God doth drive them out from before thee. The heathen always believe you could talk to the dead. They still do. And because they occupied the land and believed it, the Bible says God drove them out. From before his people. And God said now you are my people. There shall not be found among you. One of these folk. And he gave a whole list. In order to cover the field. Job 7. 9 and 10. As the cloud is consumed. And vanisheth away. 
so he that goeth down to the grave shall come up no more. He shall return no more to his house, neither shall his place know him anymore. Now, folks, that's clear. I went to a lady's house one day, and she wanted to give us a salad. And it was so nice, and I went and pulled out a chair. Oh, she said, you can't sit there. I said, oh, forgive me. Why do you want me to sit? You sit over there. And then she said, huh? nobody sat there. I said, well, if you don't mind, what's that? Oh, she said, that's my husband's place. I said, but isn't your husband dead? She said, oh, yeah, he's dead, but that, that's his place. I said, his place. The Bible says, he shall return no more to his house. Neither shall his place know him anymore. Now, I want to suggest a question for you to put in tomorrow night. Because some of you all, or somebody, has seen something. And you need to know what you saw. So put the question in. And we'll answer it for you. But I believe the Bible, don't you? The Bible says he's not coming back home. Let me tell you something about simple faith. There was an old southern lady, never went to school who heard a message like this and saw these things in the Bible. Her husband had been coming just whenever he got ready. And she would talk to him, never could put the light on, but he was there. And she would talk to him, he'd sit on the side of the bed. His name was Jim. And she got counsel from him, and she thought she enjoyed this until she heard the word of the Lord. So one night, this is a true story, one night, she made up her bed, got in it, and cut out the lights. Went off to sleep. After a while, she heard a noise. And when she looked up, there was her husband, Jim. And that woman's faith was so strong, she never faltered a minute. She had heard the word of the Lord. When you hear God's word and make up your mind that you're going to do it, it sort of clears up matters. And that old woman said to him, Jim, what are you doing here? Now, he'd been coming for a long time. But now that she hears the word of the Lord, she said, Jim, what are you doing here? You know you don't belong here. I have heard from the word of God that the dead return no more to their house. So, Jim, you get out of here. And don't you bother me ever again because I believe the word of the Lord. Would you say amen out there? Amen. Now, tomorrow night, or if you want to, or Friday night, you ask me, I'll tell you who Jim was from the Bible. He'll return no more. First Timothy 4, 1 Timothy 4.1 warns us, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly, that in the latter times, or last days, that in the latter times, some shall depart from the faith. Why? Giving heed to seducing spirits, and doctrines of devils. The devil can send somebody in the middle of the night that you think is a relative and tell you, look, you don't have to keep God's commandment. No matter how much we read it to you, the devil will use these manifestations to deceive. The Bible tells you, the Spirit speaketh expressly. That means explicitly, clearly, that in the last days, some are going to leave off faith in God because they listen to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. I want you to notice now the spirit, that's spelled with a capital S. But when you come to seducing spirits, it's spelled with a small s. The capital one refers to the Holy Ghost. He tells you that many are going to leave the faith listening to spirits from the spirit world. Doctrines of devils. Don't let it be you. Our Lord is going to come. And when he comes, he's going to settle this issue called death. The Bible says in John 5, 28 and 29, marvel not at this. For the hour is coming in the which all that are in the graves shall hear his voice and shall come forth. They that have done good unto the resurrection of life and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. But John said it hadn't happened yet. It's coming. It's coming, ladies and gentlemen. Everybody who has heard the word of the Lord is going to come. 
When is it going to happen? Now, here's the answer. And here's the good part. I'm going to take my time with this because I want you to get this. The Bible says, 1 Thessalonians 4, 16, for the Lord himself. Now, please, I want you to get every word of this. For the Lord himself shall descend. Descend means come down. Are you with me? If you are, say amen. amen. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout. With a, talking about a secret rapture. When he opens his mouth, there ain't going to be any secret. The earth will heave to and fro. The Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout. With the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. There are going to be two resurrections. And they're going to be a long way apart. But when he comes, not only is he going to shout, but the Bible tells us that the trumpet's going to sound. The old Negro spiritual used to say, they're going to blow on that long silver trumpet. And they're going to blow so loud, they're going to wake up the dead. That's just imagery in the Negro spiritual. But there's some substance to it. The voice of the archangel that commands heaven and earth and the trumpet will sound, and the dead in Christ shall rise. When? First. Now don't miss this. Don't miss this. Then. What's that word? Then. Not now. Then. then. We which are alive and remain shall be caught up together. Caught up how? Yes. With them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. There's your reference. Now let me tell you why that, why that is prettier than the era that is taught in the name of religion. Let me tell you why. Together with them is why. Now I told you about my mother. She was the mother of 11 children. I am the 10th. And you, now I know you got good mothers, but you, therefore you can, you can understand what I'm saying. My mother loved her family. She was almost indulgent. Anything for her family. And her heart was constantly concerned. I was a little whirling in high school. I wasn't praying, but she was praying. I, I believe that's how the Lord arrested me. Got my attention. My mother's prayers. And she lived the life before us all the days of her life. But now suppose my mother was already there. And sees me down here. She wouldn't be able to rest. I have been in airplanes where the storm was so bad and the plane was bucking so that everybody was scared. Coffee cups were flying. Stewardesses were crawling. Women were screaming. And I thought I'd never get home again. If my mother were up there looking at that, she would be scared to death worrying about me. I had some brothers and sisters who would never profess Christ. And I know if she were up there knowing what they're missing and what's coming, she couldn't enjoy heaven worrying about my brothers and sisters. If my mother were up there when I'm driving these highways and my brother's driving these highways and cars and trucks almost destroy you, mother would be jumping and scared half to death. And more than that, by the time I got there, she would be used to everything. No, 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 no. That's not as pretty as God's way. God says they go to the grave. They're going to wait there. I hide them in the grave. You don't have to worry about that. They don't get cold. Rain doesn't bother them. Snow doesn't bother them. Trouble doesn't bother them. They can fight wars right over the grave. Doesn't mean a thing. They are unconscious in sleep. But God has not forgotten them. Just like Job, we know that our Redeemer lives. And he's going to come and stand at the latter day. And when the trumpet sounds, my mother is coming up out of that cold gold ground. 
and she's going to look around for her children and by the grace of God there is going to be Charles and there is going to be Elliot and together what did I say yes. together we're going to see Jesus and together we're going to mount the clouds and together we're going on into outer space and as she marvels we will marvel and all of a sudden there'll be a golden city and as we approach it the angels will hear a voice saying open ye the gates that the righteous nation which keepeth the truth might enter in and they will open the gates and when mother walks in i can walk in with her we can hold hands together now my mother loved beautiful things and she'll say charles look at the flowers look at the beautiful golden streets Look at all these saints who are here. Look at Peter and James and John. Over there is Abraham and Charles. Look, there is Adam. But above all, she'll say, son, look, there is Jesus. How do you know that's Jesus, mother? The nail prints in his hand. He is the one that worked it out for us to be here. And we're going to see it together. You know that's better than an error. That mother's already in heaven. Oh, no, 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 no. The Bible says the righteous shall see it together. That's a beautiful word to me. Together, together. We're going to experience heaven together. And when you get there, one writer said, it's going to be so. In fact, the Bible says, I have not seen nor ear heard. Neither has entered the heart of man the things God is going to prepare for them that love him. The other day when I arrived here in Phoenix, a good friend of mine took me for a ride and showed me these palatial homes. i never seen grass so green, and there's green grass in a desert. And I saw the homes, and I saw the horses, and I said, boy, Phoenix is impressive, but Phoenix ain't heaven. When we get up there, it will surpass Phoenix so far and so much that all we'll be able to say is hallelujah. Hallelujah, trouble is over. Gonna lay down my sword and shield and study war no more. Bury my sword in the sands of time. Walking with Jesus. And not only that, they're gonna have good air up there. Bible said we're gonna run and not get weary. We're going to walk and not faint. My darling mother died having aged and become weak. But when she gets up there, there's going to be the spring of youth in her steps. And we'll never grow old. Would somebody say amen? amen. We got a lot to look forward to and we will see it together. Behold, I show you a mystery, said Paul. We shall not all, all sleep. Everybody's not going to die. There's going to be somebody alive when Jesus comes. But he said, we're going to all be changed. You got to be changed. You ever look at these astronauts, all that junk they got on and a bubble over their heads? If they go into outer space without that, I read this a long time ago, that their tongues would cook in their mouths. Their eyeballs would cook in their sockets. Man is not made to be out there. If man went out there in a spacesuit and it ripped open, his body would explode like an anthropomorphic balloon. He doesn't belong out there. Even when Jesus comes, we don't belong out there. So the Bible says, in order to get us out there, we're going to all be changed. Would you say amen out there? He's going to fix us in a moment in the twinkling of it. You know, I love this stuff. You all forgive me. And I'm going to try to close on time. The Bible didn't say in the winking of an eye. That takes too long. Says in the twinkling of an eye. What does that mean? It means that when your eyelid falls down over your eye to lubricate it so that your eyes do not hurt. It happens so quickly it doesn't even cut your vision. Paul said we're going to be changed. And it's not going to be done in the time it takes to wink. It's going to be done in the twinkling of an eye. As quickly as that. He said, no, 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 listen. He said as quickly as that at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. And this corruptible must put on what? And this mortal. This what? What does mortal mean? You can die. But when the trumpet sounds, you know this is clear. 
When the trumpet sounds, this mortal is going to put on what? Right now, only God has that. But when the trumpet sounds, he's going to give it to me. He's going to give it to you. Going to give it to our loved ones who are raised from the dead when Jesus comes. All of his saints are going to get it, and they're going to get it fast in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. And mortal shall put on immortality. And then the Bible says, so when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death! Where is thy sting? O oh, grave, where is thy victory? That's 1 Corinthians 15, 51 to 55. Death is going to die. Glory to God for the truth. Well, how in the world do I have a right to have immortality? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever Believeth in him. Should not perish. But should have what? I want everybody to say it. Should have what? No, no, no. I don't mean a vacation in heaven. I mean everlasting life. Everlasting life. Never die again. Never have an ache or a pain. Never feel arthritis again. Never have to worry about your teeth being filled again. Never wear eyeglasses again. Night after night, I've seen wonderful people come in here in wheelchairs. Never another wheelchair. Never any more crutches. Glory to God. It's real, and it's going to happen, and it can happen for you. I pray every day that it'll happen for me. Preaching won't make it happen. You don't get any credit for that. Jesus paid it all. It's grace. What you have to do is accept it and ask him to change your life. And when he does, obedience becomes your lifestyle. If you love me, keep my commandments. You can't earn it. You can't buy it. It's free. He died to work it out. And I pray every day, as Paul did, while I preach to others, I will not be a castaway. I say, Lord, you know I don't want to preach these powerful truths and be lost myself while other folk go to heaven. I told you about my brother. I baptized him. He's five years older than I am. And I believe he's going to make it. But I don't want him to take my crown. Let him get his own crown. I want my own. I want to be with Jesus. Don't you? Look, folk, are you all serious about this thing? Do you love the truth tonight? If you want to be ready, stand up now and close your eyes. And let's tell God our desires. And let us ask for faith and love that we might indeed be a part of his eternal inheritance. Father, we're standing. Thank you for the truth. Thank you that it is proved by many infallible texts. Not just one text and close the Bible, but the Bible supporting itself in both the Old and the New Testament. The dead are in their graves or whatever, they are not in heaven, but one day we can go together. Oh, my Father, save us. We want to be saved, don't we, people? Save us, Lord. Save us from habits and from sin and from unbelief and from disobedience and from rebellion and all these things that have us trapped right now. Set us free. Claim us as your sons and daughters. And then hold on to us, Lord. Don't let Satan take us out of your hand. I beg it in Jesus' name. There is someone who cares. Though death may close your eyes. There is someone who cares. And the dead in Christ shall rise. There is someone who cares. With him you'll mount the sky. For that someone who cares is Jesus. There is someone who cares. Fear not the lords of night. There is someone who cares. Dead men have no might. 
There is someone who cares. And he puts demons to flight. For that someone who cares is Jesus. And now may the Lord bless thee and keep thee. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon thee. And be gracious unto thee. May the Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you. And give you peace.